country. Today, we've invited leaders from a variety of different organizations to speak on how they've been inspired by PACE standards and programs. But before we go into all of that, first we want to acknowledge and thank the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg Nations for their hospitality. As I'm speaking to you today from Chiat Kake, commonly known as Montreal, a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples. The Climate Reality Project Canada and all of our guest organizations recognizes and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we are today. I'd also like to introduce myself. So my name is Dini Vangeliu and I'm the National Campaign Manager for the Climate Reality Project Canada and the moderator for today's webinar. The Climate Reality Project Canada was created in May 20, 2007 with the objective of educating Canadians about the science and impacts of climate change, as well as solutions to address it. Based on the model, the Climate Reality Project, founded by former US Vice President and Nobel Laureate Al Gore, the primary means of disseminating this information was and is still through trained climate reality leaders from all demographics, regions, sectors, and backgrounds. The climate reality leaders originally give adapted versions of the slideshow as presented in the documentary in Inconvenient Truth. On top of all this, the Climate Reality Project Canada engages in advocacy and campaign work all across the country at federal, provincial, and municipal orders of government, fighting for sound solutions to the climate crisis and climate justice. At the municipal level, yearly we publish the National Climate League, a citizen-led exercise in participative democracy. We measure 15 key sustainability indicators and in how cities across the country fare in them, ranging from air quality, affordable housing, to landfill waste. One of our key indicators is sustainable buildings, and this is partly why we brought together this field of experts today. You can access the 2020 NCL standings and climatereality.ca slash NCL. I will also post a link in the chat box right after this. Alrighty, so I'd like to first pass the floor to our guests to introduce themselves and tell us a little about the organization they are a part of. So Brian, maybe you'd like to introduce yourself first? Uh, sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Scott. I am a founding member of PACE Alberta and PACE Canada, a fairly young organization. PACE Alberta just recently formed about a year or so ago, and PACE Canada just literally just beginning to form housing board. Um, previous to that, I was a co-op development consultant since about 1982, mostly in Alberta, but with projects right across the country. And currently working a number, wearing a number of different hats, including PACE Champion. And I think that's sufficient. I think we'll, I'll pass it on to the next. Oh, and one more thing. I want to acknowledge the Klahus Slaman Hamalko nations on whose island I uh, currently live and work. I'm uh, semi-retired working from uh, my home now out on the West Coast. That's it. Great, thanks. Maybe Katie Harrison, you could go next. Yeah, hi, I'm Katie Harrison. I go by she or her, and I am here in Vancouver on unceded Coast Salish territories. And I'm a co-founder and steering committee member on PACE BC, which is a BC uh, province organization advocating for PACE, um, as well as I've been working as the PACE campaigner for Force of Nature Alliance that's putting on this webinar with support from the Real Estate Foundation of BC. Great, thank you so much. Katie Giles? Hi, I'm Katie Giles. I'm the manager of energy programs with Clean Foundation. We're an environmental nonprofit organization based in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. And I would like to acknowledge that that is located in Mi'kma'ki, which is the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Great. And last but not least, Gabby Kalapos. Hey everybody, um, Gabby Kellepush from the Cleaner Partnership. The Cleaner Partnership is an charitable environmental organization and our modus operandi is really to help municipalities implement clean air and climate change actions of which home energy efficiency and building energy efficiency retrofit programs is definitely a high priority. Thanks. Oh, and I should say that I go by he, she, her, and I also am calling in from Hamilton, which is the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas, and the Uri, and the Neutral, and the Huron Wendat. And really glad to be here. Great. Thank you so much to all of you for being here. I mean, as our, our guests can see, we have an amazing panel here today, uh, people who have a lot of expertise in the field, and so we're super, super excited to get this going. Um, so I'm going to give the spotlight right now first to Brian Scott, who's going to give us an overview of the PACE program, as well as some lessons from PACE USA that could be transferred over to our Canadian programs. Brian, the floor is yours, and you can share your slides whenever you're ready. So there you go. Can everybody see that? Okay. Let me just uh, 
hide this. Okay, well, here we go. Um, my role today is to present an overview of the US-based PACE program, uh, how it works, what makes it successful, um, how it's evolving, and ultimately how to, uh, I'm gonna illustrate how PACE can play a material role in helping Canada achieve its climate change targets and create a sustainable future. Uh, first, a bit of a status update though. Um, this, I just saw this slide yesterday. I saw it in a tweet and I thought it was a little disturbing here. Uh, CO2 levels are continuing to climb, notwithstanding the COVID slowdown around the world. So that is not good news. This is another slide I got from a report that was issued by the government of Canada recently, I think it's 2020, in which they're showing what their projected targets are that they're going to achieve depending on different uh, models that are followed. And you'll note that the target that was committed to at COP21 uh, is 511 uh, megatons of CO2, and we're not getting anywhere close to that. So we need to adopt new measures if we're going to hit that target. So this is, this is the segue into PACE. So what is PACE? So PACE is a, it's a unique financing tool that it looks like a loan, but behaves kind of like a hybrid between a local improvement charge and a school tax. Uh, the word is actually an acronym for Property Assessed Clean Energy. And it's worth noting that the word PACE is growing into an internationally recognized brand. And so there's significant value in using the word uh, PACE uh, when you're developing your programs. So most importantly as well, PACE is actually an ecosystem. And it's, it's, it's important to understand that the, the concept is simple. The ecosystem, however, is what makes it flourish. And just like a natural ecosystem, it only thrives under the right conditions. So more about the ecosystem later. Uh, of note was that the concept was developed in 2008 and by 2009, Scientific American had actually named it a top 20 world changing idea. Uh, it was developed by, Berk by uh, Cisco de Vries in Berkeley, California. And there's a long story behind that if people are interested in that. So why is PACE so successful? Because you'll see in a moment how successful it is. Well, it's because it addressed this apparent dilemma the economy versus the planet. And it, it solves that problem. And you'll see how now in a second here. So how does it work? It permits property owners to borrow money, 100% financing to install energy efficiency measures and renewable energy systems and water conservation systems, and actually a multitude of other measures um, that are fall under the sort of general umbrella of public good measures, including weather hardening, asbestos remediation, radon gas remediation, et cetera, with no money down, 100% financing, and with a loan repaid through the property taxes over the expected life of the upgrades, thus eliminating this sort of conflict between good for the planet, good for the economy, and turns buildings from energy pigs into energy superheroes. And it does that because it, it solves a number of different issues. And the, the first and foremost ones are the fact that it's attractive to property owners because it eliminates the two largest barriers that remain to them to upgrade their buildings. The first being money. And as I mentioned, it's 100% financing up front. So all of the costs associated with doing any kind of an upgrade, whether it's for new construction or for a retrofit, are covered, including any ancillary costs. And the second barrier is a significant one because even though people may be able to afford the upgrades, they often are reluctant to or don't simply do it because they're afraid that in the event that they sell, and this is especially true for homeowners, the average home is held for only about five years, which is a surprising stat. Um, a lot of homeowners go, well, if I invest in, for example, solar panels, will I recover the investment when I sell? PACE eliminates that problem. PACE completely blows the, those barriers away. And to appreciate why PACE is so important, you have to understand the scope of the issue. So I'm just gonna put a few more statistics up here. So first, Canadian building stock, and this is an average. In some jurisdictions, it's much higher and some much lower, but typically the average, uh, the, the GHG footprint, if you will, of Canada is contributed to by 30% is, is from the building stock itself. That building stock consists of 15 million homes and 580,000 commercial buildings. This is from Stats Canada 2016 census, which is obviously out of date, but gives you an idea of the magnitude of the numbers here. If we take that the average PACE loan is about 25,000 homes from the US, 
and about 820,000 for a commercial building. And assuming that only 68% of Canadians believe that climate change must be addressed. And again, from the US, only about 33% of those who take action or who are interested in saying that they will take action actually follow through on it. We end up with these numbers. It's gonna cost $177 billion to retrofit or upgrade those buildings and will create 2.6 million job years in, in the process. So but when you get your head wrapped around this number, $177 billion, you get an idea of the scope of the issue here and government dollars aren't gonna cut it. Uh, so this is why PACE comes into the equation. So the importance, I mentioned the PACE ecosystem earlier and I wanna stress how important this is. And this, this image here, gives you an idea of sort of the hierarchy to a certain extent of the ecosystem itself and, uh, and how it works. So at the very bottom, you'll see it says, we've got enabling PACE legislation and it is pivotal. It is the foundation piece on which the entire system rests. If you don't have good enabling PACE legislation, your economy, your ecosystem simply won't flourish. There was a case in point where in, in Washington state, they passed enabling PACE legislation, and for years, nothing happened. And they finally woke up one day and said, okay, well, what's going on? Why is nothing happening? Uh, we thought if you build it, they will come. They consulted with the PACE community and the PACE community said, your legislation sucks, replace it. They redrafted it using uh, input from the PACE community. And within months after passing the new act, activity started happening. So you see the next layer up is municipalities, PACE administrators, contractors, et cetera. But at the very top of this pyramid, you'll see that there's actually two, the most important stakeholders, and a third, which I'll mention in a moment here. The PACE lenders, they're the private capital providers for the most part, who put the funding up for the, the money that's borrowed, and the borrowers, of course. Those two players, their needs have to be prioritized in any kind of PACE ecosystem and PACE legislation. You'll notice also the global uh, capital investment market. That ties into the unlimited capital piece because PACE lenders will actually securitize their loans and sell them to the global market and thus be able to recapture those funds and circulate them into the PACE ecosystem again. So that's a pivotal piece in this whole thing. So this next piece is um, just a quick flow chart here that illustrates the step-by-step -step process uh, by which PACE flows. So from the investor that supplies the capital to the delivery agents, could be PACE administrators, et cetera, through to the contractors and all the way around. This slide contains a lot of detail like a few other slides that I've got. And ultimately at the end of the day, you're gonna be able to see these later and, and be able to spend more time on them. So I'm not gonna dwell on these right at the moment. I think what's really important here is to understand, and this, this hit me at my third PACE conference. I've been to three PACE conferences in the US here. And this actually was brought to my attention by one of the speakers that I was talking to. And they explained that the PACE concept itself is simple, but the ecosystem is complicated. And just like what you see here, you have blind people who are touching an elephant, if you will. Um, it's easy for them to misunderstand and think, well, an elephant is a rope, it's a spear, it's a fan, and in fact, it's not a, any one of those things, it's the, the whole thing all together. And, it, and the, the ecosystem is the piece that is often misunderstood. So first, let's look at residential PACE and see how it's being successful in the US. So to date, and this is to the end, I believe of 2019, it is actually, um, $6.4 billion has been invested in single family home upgrades and that only in four states. Recently it was only three states and, and Ohio was added. And that resulted in 280,000 home upgrades and 112,000 jobs created. And you can see here that, that the, the stats are climbing. Now they, they are leveling off a little bit and that was impacted by COVID pretty significantly. Um, you'll also note that, that I represent this stat by a tiger and there's a reason for that. You'll see that in a moment. So the... Uh, Setting up for an r -Pace program requires a lot of upfront investment and time and money. And so there's a lot of back-end that's created, uh, back-end work that's done to create an r -Pace delivery program. And you'll see here it's, it's established on this, this slide here. 
So there's a lot that goes into this. Uh, the establishment of a PACE administrator, I've been told, uh, can cost anywhere from 250000 to a million dollars, which gets it going for the first few years. Um, and so this, this, it's powerful, but it has to be very, very simple for the uh, property owners, for the homeowners. And generally, this is what the flow should look like. The owner signs up for uh, PACE uh, financing. The program provides funding for the project through a third party. The energy improvements are done by the contractor. The upgrades are completed. And the contractor is paid directly from the PACE administrator, not by the homeowner. And then the, the loan is then repaid through the tax assessments. This says 20 years, but it can be up to 30 now in the US. And it's based on the expected life of the upgrades. So PACE for the homeowner needs to be as simple as buying from Amazon. You go online, you find what you want, you hit click, you hit buy, and it's delivered to your doorstep. That's how easy PACE for residential PACE or our PACE has to be. Commercial PACE is a completely different matter altogether. This is commercial PACE. These are the stats for commercial PACE in the US. So a little over $2 billion invested so far. Uh, it took a while to get going. It's just like residential PACE. You see, it didn't really start climbing until about 2014 or 2015. Uh, with the majority of that activity since then, and it's climbing exponentially in the commercial front, and 2,500 projects completed and over 24,000 jobs. And you'll notice this is a kitten. So genetically, our pace and C-PACE are related in the same way as kittens and tigers, but the C-PACE program is a lot easier to work with. The residential pace requires a lot more attention, otherwise uh, you can get bitten pretty badly. This gives you an idea of the CPACE flow chart. And again, I'm not gonna dwell on this, but you can see a bit of the complexity associated with this. And for, for CPACE, contrasted to the experience for the homeowner, it, CPACE looks more like this. It's a do it yourself. Uh, the applicant needs to do a whole bunch of work in order to get the application approved. And so the CPACE administrator requ doesn't require as much overhead to set up. In fact, in one state, um, in actually three states, there's a single administrator with an office of three people that handles all three states in the US. So it's a minimal front end investment to set up a CPACE administrator. Uh, nevertheless, the demand for CPACE loans is increasing because of many, many uh, unique benefits. And this is just a list of some of those benefits. I did a screen capture of one of the CPACE originators that are the lenders in the US. They listed these uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. You see the benefits that they're promoting. And uh, on the left, you see the list of everything that typically uh, it makes it very attractive uh, to, the, uh, to the commercial borrower. And you'll note that low interest rate is not on that list. And there's a reason for that, which I'll touch on later. There's an interesting question around why PACE took off as, as well as it did. And I think it had to do with the fact that we had prime the pump. There were motivated building owners. Uh, there were investors that are looking for secure long-term investments, ready and willing contractors and consultants. We've been encouraging people to, to promote uh, energy awareness and uh, retrofits and whatnot. And green municipalities, the piece that was missing, however, was the PACE gear that kind of made all of these things mesh together and work. And PACE is a catalyst. And when it works really well, it creates a healthy ecosystem that looks like this. But when it doesn't work well, it looks more like this. And the reason it looks like this is because of all of the barriers, unintended barriers with unintended consequences that are put in place that look like this. And there, these barriers are uh, imposed by legislation, by regulation, by high admin burdens, there's a bunch of things that contribute to uh, slowing a, a, a pace uptake program down. Um, the next slide we're going to, the next set of slides are going to be key uh, parameters that are identified, that have been identified that, that determine the success of a pace program. And the first one, probably one of the most important ones, is that there has to be an unlimited amount of capital available for lending to borrow to pace borrowers, and that is done through that program I mentioned earlier, where private capital lenders are able to securitize their loans. So they'll lend out you know, uh, 20, 30, 40 projects. Uh, the largest pace loan right now is actually 50 million on a single project. Anyways, they'll, they'll, they'll aggregate their projects, securitize them, 
sell them off to the global market, and then be able to refund and rebuild their coffers. And you can see here with this headline that you know the international market is uh, is recognizing that this is pay securitization is a very powerful tool and is growing. Second most important uh, observation is that third-party administrators in the U.S. are the predominant model. So municipalities and tax collection agencies have very little to do. Uh, the city administration really is very nominal and we'll see it, what, that their role is limited to filing the tax lien, which provides the security uh, to the investors and collecting and remitting the, uh, the PACE uh, payments over the expected life. And they pay those to the third party administrator who in turn refunds uh, or pays the, uh, the investors. The city gets compensated for its work as well as the administrator, and that's part of the fee structure. And the, the admin role is typically associated with a relatively small fee. This is Cisco de Vries, and, and at a conference a few years ago, I heard him say this, and it was a, a very important piece to understand. And this is what he said. He said, there are only a few ways to structure a PACE ecosystem successfully. And there are a multitude of ways to encumber it to the point of failure. And I made reference to that earlier in terms of Washington state. And we'll see more about this later, but this slide here gives you an idea of sort of contrast and compare. And without wanting to slam Toronto, um, in the space of time between 2014 and 2019 in the USA, 198,000 projects were funded to the tune of $5.4 billion. In that same time frame in, in Toronto, best of my understanding, 202 projects were funded to the tune of about $15 million. And I know that the populations are different, but even when you factor population in, there's a hundred times ratio factor that is not uh, uh, to scale, if you will. So there's something that's significantly different here that makes these two programs operate so differently. And to understand that, I've captured, this is what the Toronto program steps were uh, to get PACE funding. Step one, complete an application form, get mortgage lender approval, book a home energy assessment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You go through this whole thing and it would take weeks, if not months, to go through the whole thing to finally get the reimbursement at the end. Contrast that with Y Green, which were this one of the um, residential PACE uh, providers in the US. And you'll note on here, it says, submit an application, get a decision within 30 minutes. That's it. So contractors can meet with a homeowner and say, hey, I understand you want to replace your windows. I'm also a PACE certified contractor. If you're interested, we can finance your upgrade uh, to better windows, but we can put in the best windows available in the market. Are you interested? And the homeowner goes, sure. What's involved? Well, they can literally sit at the kitchen table, fill out the application online, get an approval within 30 minutes. Contractor walks away with a signed contract and uh, away you go. So quick recap here of the pr three principal success parameters. Unlimited capital, it puts the borrower in the middle of the equation in terms of whose needs are being met. So it solves the borrower's problem and it motivates an army of volunteer promoters. And I can't stress how important this is. 80 to 85% of PACE projects in the US were taken out by people who didn't know anything about PACE until a contractor or a consultant sat down with them and said, you should be aware of this. And the only reason consultants and contractors are doing this is because it benefits them. So it's not just good enough to build a tool, you have to create an army of volunteers out there who are promoting and selling pace and having that face-to-face -face foot in the door uh, uh, conversation, if you will. So here's some now some key, key takeaways. So first, PACE legislation has to be adopted, follows best practices experience, or best practice experiences from the USA. So you build a good sandbox, the government steps out, provides good consumer protection oversight, makes sure that, that the programs are adhering to the goals that are being established and stays out of the way. The, the second point is, is that the legislative framework has to entice private capital players. If we don't get private capital players into this equation, into the PACE ecosystem, we will not be able to satisfy the demand. And when you can't satisfy the demand, especially on the CPACE front, 
you will not have people investing the front end time on the CPACE front. It takes two to six months to complete an application process and thousands of dollars. No commercial applicant is going to go through that process if they get to the end of that and they're told, sorry, we ran out of funds this year. So we need unlimited capital. And the only way to do that, as far as I can tell, based on experience, is using capital providers that are providing from the, the private sector. The, 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 the key, another key takeaway is, is that the PACE ecosystem has to cleave to best practices, best practice characteristics. And those characteristics are elaborated in uh, CHBA, the Canadian Home Builder Association net zero statement that's found at this link here. But I've captured them here, essentially unlimited capital, recognizing the distinction between CPACE and RPACE, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that that's a very important point to note. This slide has got too much stuff on it, so I'm not going to dwell on it because what, but it's there for your reference afterwards and it's, it's available on the PACE Canada website. These are the characteristics of what the program should embody. And there's uh, 14 characteristics here, 12 rather, that, that list everything that the PACE program in an ideal form should be able to address, including, by the way, if you look at number 12, retroactive financing. So in the US, they're now, they're actually financing projects after they've been done. And in, in Kentucky, they, they finance them retroactively, no matter how old the project is, as long as there's still a payback and it retroactively financed for the balance of the payback period. And finally, um, just the last key takeaway here, there's people we've, I've talked to people, my, my associates at Pace Canada have talked to people in the US who are looking forward to working with Canada uh, and Canadians to help develop their Pace program. So there's available expertise and willing expertise in the US. I'm getting close to the end here. I'm just gonna wrap this up. So Pace is successful because it's a win, 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 win formula. It solves the problems of the client, creates jobs, saves money, and doesn't cost one penny of tax dollars. Part of the reason for that is because it harnesses the power of capital and of the free markets in the service of sustainable measures. And it holds thus the key to delivering the greatest reduction in CO2 in the shortest amount of time, which I think is critical here. And I'll leave you with just a final thought. If you haven't heard of Richard Thaler, you should look him up. He won a Nobel Prize in economics. He's the creator, or the concept creator of the nudge principle. And he's famous for saying, if you want people, among other things, if you want people to do something, make it easy. And that's what this, the commercial and residential PACE programs in the US do when they're successful. So I'm just gonna, I, I put up a few, um, Links here again, you'll be able to go to these uh, when you get a, a copy of the, um, of the document and uh, the recording, you'll be able to see these, but these are recent documents that have been uh, done, uh, white papers and academic papers, which document the impact that PACE is having in the US and, uh, and basically make the case that it is actually a very solid and very positive program uh, to embrace. That's it, those are my credits. Thank you all very much for listening. Great. Thank you so, so much, Brian. That was really, really informative. Um, I want to thank you for that. And also thank you to all of our panelists who are live answering all the questions that are coming in in the Q&A box. So continue asking those away. They'll be, they'll be available during the presentations to ask whatever we can live. And yeah, all those resources will be available afterwards as well. We will also have a recording available of the webinar. I should have made that clear at the beginning as well. So if there's anything you missed, don't worry about it. <laughs> Alrighty, I'm now going to pass it on to Katie Giles from the Clean Foundation, who's going to give us a look into the context out east. Katie, it's all yours. Hey, thank you so much, Dean. I'm just going to bring up my screen to share with everyone here. Oh, can everyone see that okay? Yeah, perfectly. Super. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about clean energy financing for the most part, which is our version of a PACE program um, here in Clean Foundation with uh, and we're in partnership with several municipalities on that. Um, before I get into that, I will uh, oh, 
mentioned slides here. There we go. Tell you a little bit more about who we are. So as I mentioned earlier, we are an environmental nonprofit. We're, we're a charity based in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Um, and our passion is providing knowledge, tools, and inspiration needed to encourage actions leading to positive environmental change. A um, little bit more about the type of work we do. We try to reduce energy poverty, promote social equity, support historically marginalized communities, develop the green workforce, uh, protect the natural environment, and educate and promote action on climate change. And you can find more information on our website as well. Oh, my slide shows going backwards. All right, I'm gonna uh, do a quick overview of some of the other upgrade programs in Nova Scotia that are out there. Uh, there is a lot of market confusion in Nova Scotia, but it's also um, fantastic because we do have a lot available to homeowners to take advantage of. Um, so in terms of a, a free program, we have home warming and that program offers no charge energy assessments and and upgrades to homeowners who are eligible. Uh, those homeowners are on lower fixed income. It's offered by Efficiency Nova Scotia and Clean Foundation, sponsored by Nova Scotia Power and the province of Nova Scotia. There's also the Home Energy Assessment Program, which is an Efficiency Nova Scotia program, offering home energy assessments to homeowners for 90 nine dollars and it allows them to take advantage of financing opportunities or up to five thousand dollars in rebates for upgrades completed in the home um, we have several pace programs so solar city is in halifax regional municipality solar colchester and those as as you can gather from the title, focus specifically on, on solar upgrades. Our clean energy financing program is currently available in seven municipalities in Nova Scotia, and uh, we work with homeowners to do a variety of energy efficient upgrades in the home. And there's also Pace Atlantic, who will be working with uh, a municipality here in Nova Scotia, as well as a couple in Prince Edward Island. Um, Again, adding a bit to that confusion, but great because the options are out there. Efficiency Nova Scotia does have some other programs. Nova Scotia Power offers heat pump financing. Um, there's a heat pump program that's being offered by several municipalities. I believe it's a group of four municipalities in Nova Scotia. And um, we also have a website, energyassist.ca, um, which helps homeowners. They can go there, put in some details about where they're located and their income level, and it'll let them know what free programs are available to help them out. So all those links will be there in the, in the slideshow and to get that at the end, if you want to check out any of those. I'm going to now jump into our clean energy financing program. Try not to repeat too much of, of what Brian said, um, but again, property assessed clean energy, a PACE. And so this is a version of a PACE program. Uh, we're offering low interest financing for clean energy upgrades, and that financing is attached to the property tax account. Our clean energy financing program, in order to be eligible, you need to own a single detached, semi-detached or row house, live in one of the participating municipalities and have no municipal arrears. We do have a couple of municipalities who have chosen to add a credit check to that. Um, but for the most part, the municipalities go with that check on, on property taxes owing and, and that works very well. Um, low interest rates, four to five percent interest over 10 years, depending on the municipality, and the money saved through the energy upgrades meets or exceeds the cost of the financing. So your investment pays for itself. And I'll talk a bit more about that and our one to one debt to savings ratio. Uh, there's a little bit of information on the bottom there just around around cleans expertise in the area. Um, recommendations for the program are all based on Enercan home energy assessments. The homes are out evaluated by certified energy auditors, and um, our energy advisors have performed over 20,000 energy assessments, and there are actually several other service organizations within Nova Scotia as well. We currently have seven municipalities who are offering uh, PACE financing to homeowners through the Clean Energy Financing Program. Um, they're all listed here. Um, they're very 
happy usually to help out, um, chat with anyone who's interested in, you know, how they got involved in the program, what their experience um, has been with it. So if you do have questions that are more specific to the municipal side of things, rather than being a program administrator, please feel free to reach out to me and, and I'll put you in touch with, with someone at one of the municipalities that can certainly help answer those. Um, steps. So as third party administrator, we wanted to um, make this process as easy as possible for both the municipalities and the homeowners. Um, municipalities in Nova Scotia are often quite small in size. We have a large number of municipalities and they don't often have a lot of staff time um, and resources to be able to dedicate to the administration of the program. So we take on the bulk of the admin work for a, for a financing file. So a homeowner would submit the registration form. We would check with the municipality briefly to see if there's any property taxes owing. They fill out the customer agreement form and we help them through that process. They then have that home energy assessment. So that certified um, evaluation of the home to see what upgrades would make sense. There's several service organizations, as I mentioned in Nova Scotia, Clean being one of them. The great thing about having the home energy assessment done is that it also opens up the option to these homeowners to um, take advantage of the rebates available through that program as well. So they have the upfront financing through the municipality to help them out with completing the upgrades and they're, they're gonna get some rebate money for those upgrades being done. Uh, we do an assessment of the debt to savings ratio. So our tech team takes a look at the information from the initial home energy assessment and the quotes being submitted by the homeowners. We want to make sure that any upgrades completed through the program as an overall upgrade package are going to have a payback period of 10 years or less because that's the, the financing period for the homeowners. So we want to make sure the homeowners are going to see either their money back uh, equally over those 10 years or better. So we want them to be, you know, cash flow neutral or cash flow positive uh, because of participating in this program. Contractor work is completed. The homeowners are responsible for booking and um, submitting invoices to clean. We pay the contractors and then bill the municipality for work completed and any admin fees owing for the homeowner. Um, contractor work, our program, in order to uh, ensure that the work is done well and up to a certain standard, we do require all work to be completed by a contractor. The homeowners cannot perform their own upgrades. And we do require that any contractors used have WCB clearance as well as proof of liability insurance. Um, and from there, we would close out the file with the municipality. So we would send them an invoice for anything, um, as I mentioned, the contractor invoices and admin fees, and then send them a summary for the homeowner's file. From there, the municipality does take on um, some admin work where they set up the payment plans and would follow through for the 10 years that the financing is being paid off. And that's a separate payment. So it is attached to the property tax account, um, but it is a separate monthly payment in our case. We do charge some uh, service fees to cover our admin costs. We're looking at um, lowering those, but we haven't found it to be um, a huge barrier but we do know that the program certainly would be more appealing if those admin fees were lower. So, and we've broken it out um, into different stages so that if a homeowner does choose to leave the program early, they're only responsible for the admin fees up to the point where they exited the program. Um, for municipalities, the municipal process would be here in Nova Scotia to approve and have a bylaw in place that allows the municipality to offer financing to property owners. Uh, I know there was a question in the, the Q&A there that I responded to the, the bylaws and any PACE policies that the municipalities have put in place in Nova Scotia are all public on their on their websites. So if anyone's looking, you know, for an example to, to read through, Again, please reach out, happy to share some links with you um, to help out with that. We work to collaborate with the municipality. We tailor the program to each of their specific needs. And I'll talk a bit about the different items um, that they kind of customize 
on another slide. And then the financing payments are a responsibility of the municipality. So they're going to collect those monthly follow up with the file over the lifetime of, of the financing contract with the homeowner. For our program, we charge a one time um, onboarding fee to be the administrator of $13,300. And we're very lucky here in Nova Scotia. The idea of PACE programs is highly supported by the Department of Energy and Mines. They really want to see this become something that every municipality if possible in Nova Scotia is participating in. And currently they're providing funding to cover startup costs in year one of up to $15,000 uh, to the municipality. So the really simplicity um, and ease for, for municipalities is, is a big thing here. So taking off as much of the administrative burden, um, not having to pay those, those startup fees directly, having the support to cover those, all of that really helps with getting people started in the program. Marketing and communications, we in year one offer marketing and communications to the municipalities. And beyond that, it is normally their responsibility. We found again that that is, is tough for the municipalities, again, budgets, staff time, all of those things. Um, so as part of some funding that we um, applied for recently, we're going to be offering uh, marketing over the, the four years that funding's available to the, to the uh, municipalities on a consistent basis um, to really help support them with that. Um, some of the things that we do provide are, are on here. I won't read those all off, but if you want to take a look, a look through later, um, that slide is in there. I talked a little bit about customizing it for each municipality. So the municipalities choose the total amount of funding that they feel that they can offer to homeowners. They set the limit on the maximum amount of financing per home. We have... Um, Municipalities ranging anywhere from five homes per year at $10,000 up to, you know, 10 homes per year at $25,000. Um, and right now they've all chosen a 10 year payback period, uh, but that could be longer if they wanted to. Um, one thing that we do encourage is kind of a minimum of 15,000 if it is possible for the municipalities, and we're starting to encourage them to look at extending that payback period to, to 15 years, and the reasons for that is because uh, it allows more upgrades to fit into that one to one debt to savings ratio, things like solar that do have a bit of a longer payback period, but are still incredibly beneficial to the homeowner uh, would then fit into the program easier. Um, yeah, and a bit of our results to date. So the program has been running since 2016, originally started out with four municipalities in Nova Scotia who uh, put out an RFP looking for a program administrator. Um, some of the common upgrades that have been completed with homeowners um, over the years are insulation, drafts, ceiling, windows, heat pumps, hot water tanks, HRVs, and enabling upgrades. And what enabling upgrades are is the program allows in the case of, for example, a heat pump where the homeowner may need to do some work such as upgrading their electrical panel prior to that heat pump being installed, the program allows for them to finance those enabling upgrades. Um, there's many other retrofits on our list and I can send a link to our, our frequently asked questions document which, which shares the whole list of upgrades that homeowners can take advantage of. An average completion time of about five to seven months for a homeowner file. And we find that homeowners on average use about 75% of the financing that's available to them. Since the program launched in 2016, 60 participants have completed the program. So again, we've had we started out with four municipalities for the first, I believe it was three years of the program. Um, bumped up to, to seven currently. We have two more that'll be joining us. Um, average payback period for that debt to savings ratio is uh, 6.8 years. We have some estimated greenhouse gas savings there, 357 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent, estimated annual energy savings of 3,450.1 gigajoules, and estimated annual fuel cost savings of $67,132. Um, 
one, a testimonial from one of our participants who went from three and a half tanks of oil in, or sorry, from three tanks of oil in two and a half months to half a tank in a month and a half. So they found it had an immediate positive impact on their finances. And we hear that from several of our participants. Um, so it, you know, it's beneficial to the homeowners, it benefits the municipality. It's very low risk for the municipalities where it is attached to the, the property tax account. Um, if you want more info about the program, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you can visit our website, cleanenergyfinancing.ca. And if you want more information on PACE programs in general uh, in Nova Scotia, you can visit novascotiapace.ca. We're, we're incredibly proud of being a leader with several successful programs in Nova Scotia, not just ours. So be sure to check them all out. Um, that's all for me for now. Thank you everyone for your time and I'll, I'll look for questions in the, um, the Q&A section. Great, thanks so much, Katie. Um, it's really cool to hear what the work that you're doing out there, uh, out east. Um, so yeah, I mean, continue to answer those questions. We got a lot coming in, which is really great. It means that you guys are engaged and you guys are learning a lot, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna pass it on to our next panelist. Uh, so Gabby from the Clean Air Partnership, uh, take it away. Hey there, everybody. Thanks so much, Dean. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of the story. I'm just going to make sure I get it into slideshow we'll format. Come on, computer. Why are you not doing that? Sorry, give me one sec. So I'll give you a little bit of the story of the evolution of the uh, PACE programs in Ontario. Uh, a little bit of lessons learned from that process as well that we're more than happy to share. Uh, hopefully it's of value to other folks. Just a bit of background, as I mentioned, uh, a Clean Air Partnership, we're a charitable environmental organization. These are some of the other projects in addition to the home energy efficiency work that we've been doing with municipalities, but we also work on complete streets, vision zero and active transportation policies, EV strategies, work on adaptation air pollution, ensuring that municipalities are getting their own house in order and that they're, um, they're, moving, they're, they're moving on their own front to achieve the climate emergency targets um, that they set for the community as well. So moving towards net zero emissions targets for their own operations. Um, and then also working on green standards and home retrofits as well and climate lens and accountability. So in Ontario, the legislation came into play in 2012. Um, actually, it was one of the first, the, one of the last things that Kathleen Wynne did before she left um, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing as the minister to become the um, premier of Ontario. Um, um, so what, that was one of the last things she did. The legislation is, um, you know, that, that got enacted in 2012. That's fantastic. Uh, I did want to kind of highlight, it's called local improvement in Ontario. It's LIC, PACE, exactly the same thing, just different names. It's just that there's a traditional name of local improvement charges in Ontario. And that's one of the reasons why they did it. Most of the time, local improvement charges were done at the community scale for uh, let's say sewers or sidewalks or things that they wanted to add to the uh, add to that community um, and then they would attach a charge onto a property tax that people would pay back over time um, this change in the legislation just allowed the the LIC mechanism to be put into play at the individual property level and for energy efficiency water conservation or other types of measure that municipalities have determined um, that they would like to use their LIC for so really one of kind of the key sense, one of the first things that happened when this legislation change came into play is that we worked with a whole ser a group of municipalities who all had collective questions uh, associated with like, what is PACE? How does it work? All of that different types of stuff. What's the type of programming? What's the leading practices? Who's doing what in what jurisdiction? So that led to the collaboration for home energy efficiency in Ontario, um, it's a, and it was a collective effort. It really looked at program design, leading practices, FAQs and primers, legal opinions, and lessons learned from other jurisdictions. And all the resources from that effort are all available at that link. Um, it, the, I, please don't like the use as use as well. Like this is the part where we're just trying to kind of reduce the amount of duplication. And um, there's lots of great resources there. Um, and uh, uh, while it is speaking to the Ontario context, there's um, there's a lot of transferability. So I just want to kind of highlight those resources. So in the early years, after we did all the research and did the collective kind of like, okay, what makes for a, a great PACE program? How do you set it up? What are the key kind of factors that are really, really important to bring into the design? 
The city of Toronto launched their home energy loan program. They did it in 20, uh, 2015. Here's an, a lesson learned on unintended consequences that happen quite <laughs> often. Um, when we, uh, when Toronto launched their program, we thought this is great, this is fantastic. We're gonna get a whole bunch of other programs into market um, shortly thereafter. When Toronto launched that program, what ended up happening um, was that a lot of other municipalities in Ontario sat back and sort of like, okay, let's see how the Toronto program plays out and then learn from that. What that meant is that Toronto's program um, kind of like in some ways, it's a fan, you know, it's, it, 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 it showed us a lot of the learning and challenges associated with these types of programs and running them. They do cost a lot in terms of administrative setup. There's an efficiency of scale that we know needs to be done and doing them at the individual property, at individual municipal level is not the most cost effective way of doing this because of the admin burden associated with this program. So we knew that there was an element of trying to get some aggregation happening and simplifying a third party model that would allow municipalities to opt into a program. So that's definitely something that was kind of the early layers, the learnings that we've got thus far. There is an element of the efficiency of scale that you want to get through third party um, models that can enable them. It doesn't mean it's the only model that can work. A municipality could always, if they really want to go and, uh, and deliver their program, they can always go choose that, that mechanism. But there, there's a lot of municipalities that won't be able to do that on their own and need, so need to work with a third party um, or a partnership model that can help them deliver that to these programs to their communities. So really that's one of the key things that we've learned thus far on the early time per period. We did learn that just because you put a PACE program into market, um, that is only the first step. And there's a whole bunch of enabling ecosystem factors that you also have to get into the program in order to, for it to achieve the scale up and the uptake that we all know that these programs need to achieve to, achieve, uh, to get our GHG reductions. So uh, there are some improvements that we have been really trying to push for in uh, Ontario's PACE legislation. Really when it comes down to it, um, the PACE legislation that was set up at the province of Ontario when it was uh, uh, in 2012 was definitely geared towards the idea that municipalities would be running their own programs. It wasn't really set up to be able to have, um, what wasn't able to be set up for a third party delivery. There's some improvements on the legislation that could improve um, enabling third party delivery in Ontario. And we are working to try and get that to happen. However, we are not stalling. We really want to get programs in market because that's the most important thing. We have to get programs in market. We will also be advancing uh, improvements on the PACE legislation whenever that opportunity comes to us. So uh, some of the other improvements, um, just kind of providing clarification, just that new buildings and existing buildings are both eligible for PACE is something that we would love to try to see as um, just clarity in the legislation. You know, certainly our interpretation is that it is, and there's there's no reason for it. What we're just trying to avoid is having every municipality who wants to do this have to go through a legal review to see if this is actually clarity would be of value in the late in the legislation. We also would like to kind of highlight that commercial properties are eligible for PACE programming. And the only reason, and, I, and you know, keep in mind, again, these are just improvements. It doesn't mean that it can't be done. We know that PACE commercial properties, there's no reason why commercial properties um, in our interpretation could not be, uh, 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 that are eligible for PACE programming. There's, it's just this streamlining and clarity would help reduce the um, legal reviews within municipalities and um, provide uh, increased clarity on, on what's eligible and what, what's, what's within the game and what's not within the game. Really, again, keep in mind like that it's up to the municipality to identify the measures. I personally think the legislation is pretty clear that it's up to the municipality to improve the legis uh, to identify what eligible measures will be part of the PACE program. Some municipalities would like some greater clarity on that. So these are just some of the learns that, uh, learnings that we've gotten thus far on what could be possible improvements uh, on into Ontario's PACE legislation. So right now we're at the program point. I would guess I'll, I'll give you a little story in the sense that um, one of the key things that we were really hoping for in Ontario is during the last um, uh, government, there was a green on organization. There was a lot of hope that the green on organization was gonna be the one to deliver a province wide pace programming. And we were very, very thankful and hopeful about that. 
then when we had the government change in Ontario, um, I like to joke that green on became green off and, uh, and we sat there and we licked our wounds for a period of time. Having said that, just because of the government changes on that one doesn't mean they, doesn't mean anything's uh, changed on this. We know we have to advance this. So what what's uh, when FCM came out with their community efficiency financing program, a lot of municipalities really moved, you know, really, really keen. We were super excited about it. One of the things we did have to learn about this is that in some ways it's kind of like um, I, I kind of think about the silver lining of losing the province-wide program means that we are going to be um, forced to move in the direction of community projects being advanced. It's not going to be a province-wide approach that we are able to achieve at this point in time. Having said that, the, 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 the community-based programs, as long as we all make sure that we're working together to streamline this and create a cohesive branding and cohesive program for the customers, which I think is critically, critically important, it does mean that we have a little bit more of a flexible approach. We can have more creativity. We can try different approaches in different communities. So, you know, and the silver lining is that we lost the efficiency of a, of a province-wide program, but in uh, many other ways, we built some resilience and creativity and innovation and entrepreneurialism into these pro pro community programs, which probably would not have been able to be achieved at a province-wide program. So I did want to kind of highlight pros and cons of different approaches. Um, one of the key things that we're really trying to ensure now is uh, working on getting programs into market. As I said, uh, Toronto is the only one with a program in Ontario in market, but there is going to be four more jurisdictions coming up within the next six months having programs in market. That would include, um, you know, Vaughan, um, Vaughan Ottawa, uh, Guelph, and Durham Region. And there's even more municipalities who are building up their uh, readiness to be able to deliver programs. So there's going to be some increased momentum taking place in Ontario, finally, after eight years of work. <laughs> so we also recognize the one thing we have learned from the Toronto experience on the home energy efficiency loan program is just because you build it doesn't mean they come. And we really know that we have to do a far better job of building a more supportive ecosystem um, for homeowners and property owners to be able to advance these retrofits. Anyone who's done a renovation knows the hassle of managing a renovation. Now, who are the people who are going to be willing to kind of take that, you know, that burden on within their home? And how can we streamline that for individuals who don't want to take on the part time job of finding contractors, managing contractors, scheduling contractors? How do we get a turnkey um, option available to them that, the, that, that, that can meet their needs without the burden of managing a whole retrofit? So one of the key areas that we know we have to do, we have to build enough demand to be able to kind of uh, share that, to move towards that turnkey model. We may not be able to get out of the gate with a turnkey model in many of the programs, but the goal is that over time, we would start building a customer base who want that turnkey approach and that's gonna move, um, move um, enable uh, a lot more opportunities for turnkey programs. So one of the key things that I wanted to kind of highlight really when it coming into knows, we know that the, con the contractor and renovator world do not have the uh, building science expertise that they know that they that they need to have in order to ensure that quality retrofits are done. So definitely for early stages, the Enercan pre and post audit will be a very, very important thing to do some quality assurance on the retrofits taking place. We also know that we have to move into getting some increased tr um, training on the part of contractors and renovators to get that building science and energy efficiency expertise. We know that we got to advance a retrofit code so that we can kind of drive actions, um, drive um, retrofits um, rather than just the voluntary opt-in opt -in option. So that's something that we're definitely looking for. How do we build that kind of market for the retrofit code to drive uptake? We also know that we have to do a much better job of building the value proposition for homeowners to undertake this. It's one thing for the energy savings to pay back the loan. It's a nif another thing when you build the value proposition in terms of the increased property sale or uh, resale value of your home because of your energy efficiency. Energy labeling is critical to that uh, to building that market and that drive for it. So I did want to kind of highlight the stages that we're kind of going through, where we are right now, what we've done in the past, what we've learned thus far, and then where we're hoping to go into the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you so, so much, Gabby. We learned a lot about what's going on in Ontario. 
Um, so yeah, just a reminder, this event does go on until 2.30. We will try to have the last like five to 10 minutes at this rate uh, for a Q&A. But like I said, I think it's great that we have the Q&A box that's really popping off. So we already have a very lively Q&A sort of going on behind the scenes at all times, which is great. Um, all right, I'm going to pass it again back to Brian to speak about what's going on in Alberta specifically before we get into our last speaker, Katie Harrison. All right, go for it. Yep, give me a second here. And I think I've got to get screen control back because I'm seeing somebody else's screen here right now. Oh, hang on. Maybe this is it. Nope. Um, let's go to share. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Okay. And go. Okay. Now I'm just going to move. Oh, sorry. It put me right back to the beginning. So I'm going to. I could just pick up where I left off, but there you go. For those of you who are speed readers, <laughs> this is the recap. Okay, here we go. State of Pace in Alberta, this will be quick. So um, Pace Alberta started working on this back in 2016. Uh, through the course of the next few years after that, we were going across the province at trade shows and events and doing presentations and having booths. And the result of our efforts was that- Brian, to, if you could just click on the display settings button on the top left-hand corner and uh, choose to share, oh, not, not within Zoom, but within PowerPoint. We're not seeing the full screen at the moment. Yeah. Okay, that's what I was wondering about. Um, oh yeah, here, hang on. How's that? Yes. Okay, sorry. I will back up here for a second here. Actually, you know what? <laughs> That's fine. This is the slide you need to see. So the hearts represent docu uh, communities where the, the municipality actually passed a resolution saying that they wanted to embrace and deliver a PACE program to their constituents. Uh, once the details were available. So this is prior to the legislation being passed. The diamonds, the yellow diamonds represent communities that had basically raised their hands and said to us, we are interested. We want, we want to see a PACE program uh, available for our constituents. They had never actually passed the PACE legislation or the PACE bylaw themselves. So then uh, in April, 2018, the New Democratic Party passed Bill 10, which they unfortunately called the Clean Energy Improvement Bill instead of PACE. And the reason they called it that is because somebody in the room said to them, uh, hey, there's this group called PACE Alberta. If we call it PACE, uh, the public will be confused. And that was a very unfortunate uh, decision on their part because now they call it, they keep calling it the SEEP program, also known as PACE. Anyways, um, in 2019, January 1st, 2019, the act became law. Uh, in September, there began to be a number of programs that were being explored in development. The city of Edmonton started, at least in terms of their own uh, sort of administration, a pilot um, a development of a pilot program in January of 2020. However, this is the important point. The legislation was passed over two years ago, not one project yet has been financed. And according to my conversations with my contacts at the city of Edmonton, they don't expect any money to flow out the door until Q2 or Q3 2021, and, and then only for residential pace, and then only for about 25 homes as a pilot. So what's wrong with the current framework? Well, basically, one, it blocks private capital from participating. Two, it fails to include a public good clause, so it created an impediment to that private capital participation and exposes uh, the province and program lenders to a potential legal challenge, according to the interpretation in the US. It eliminated the appeal for municipalities because it went from legislation that would have made it simple and no risk for the municipalities, which is basically register the tax lien, collect and remit to high cost and high perceived risk. And whether it's real or not, municipalities 
If they think there's a risk, they're going to hold back. City of Calgary is a good example. They looked at the city of Edmonton. I heard uh, one of the presenters earlier make mention of that. Uh, I think it was Gabby. And we had the same thing happen. Calgary looked north and said, okay, Edmonton's doing something. We're going to wait and see what happens. Um, the number four problem is, is that they turned it from a financing tool into a government controlled energy efficiency tool. There's a long discussion that we can get into here, but the bottom line is this, if you want the private sector to engage, the government can't be overly engaged because the minute the government is overly engaged, the private sector says, well, if we up, if we scale up to deliver on this, and then the government changes and things get canceled, which is exactly what happened in Alberta, energy uh, efficiency Alberta were created by the new Democrats to deliver the PACE program and they were funded, et cetera. And then the, the UCP came into power and eliminated that organization and set everything back. So the private sector hesitates as long as the government has too many fingers in the pie. And the number five problem, which was probably pretty significant, it was also that they precluded PACE financing being available for new construction. So they made it only available for retrofits. And while they were at it, they put caps on, they put arbitrary caps. They said uh, 50,000 for a single family home and originally only, uh, um, sorry, yeah, 50,000 for a single family home and um, 500,000 for commercial. And at the time, commercial in the US was already at 500,000 as an average and was already financing $25 million projects. Um, but they put these caps in there and uh, it created a, a big uh, impediment again for the private sector players to come in. So basically this is what it came down to. Uh, we, Pace Alberta, gave the, the government everything they needed, uh, as far as we could tell, <laughs> to enact, enact good legislation. They handed it to their bureaucrats who handed it to the lawyers who came back and basically said, if you want to avoid liability for the province, then this is what you can do, which was basically uh, a very crippling type of act. We are currently working on trying to get the current legislation actually completely overturned and replaced so that it will meet these goals, structured for private investment, remove, remove the uh, administrative burden and risk to the municipality, add public good coverage, and rename the legislation. That's basically the status update for Alberta. Great, thank you so much for jumping on again, Brian. You're welcome. Um, gonna, yeah, <laughs> so I'm now gonna pass it to Katie Harrison, who's our last speaker of the event. And uh, yeah, she's gonna speak specifically about what's happening out west in BC. And I give you the floor, Katie. Oh, you're on mute, Katie. So can you hear me okay through my phone now? There you go. Yeah, all good. Okay, fantastic. I'm, I'm on two systems. So let me know if you have any sound problems and I'll switch over. Um, I'll just share my screen here and I'll try to race through so that we can get some time for questions. Um, okay, can you see my screen okay? Um, I think we still see. Reviewing Canada branches screen. Yeah, exactly. Try, Try again. Now we're not sharing it anymore. There you go. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, my name is Katie and um, I'm um, one of the co-founders of PACE BC, and that was a project of the Force of Nature Alliance that's also uh, a co-presenter on this webinar with support from the Real Estate Foundation of BC. Um, I'm here in unceded Coast Salish territories, uh, the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and PACE BC represents um, the entire province of British Columbia, which is mostly unceded uh, First Nations territory as well. Um, so we're the newest province coming to the table with PACE, uh, and, but we do have some very strong climate targets in BC. Our provincial climate targets are a 40% reduction in GHGs by 2030, 60% by 2040, and 80% by 2050. 
Those aren't equivalent to the IPCC targets, which are calling for 100% by 2050. And Force of Nature did work on a lot of climate emergency declarations, and we made sure that all the ones that we worked on um, ensured that municipalities committed to the IPCC targets. So a lot of, on the municipal level, a lot of uh, community climate targets now in the lower mainland are higher than that, and um, as well as in urban areas. So 34% uh, of UC municipalities have made climate emergency declarations representing 60% of the population of BC. And within that, an average of 30% of emissions in BC municipalities come from the building sector in many municipalities, especially the urban areas, that figure is much higher and close to 50%. And so what that boils down to, these are calculations from um, a Pace BC collaborator, the Permanent Institute, uh, that said in BC alone, we'll need to retrofit 30 thousand homes, 17,000 apartments, and 3 million square meters of commercial space every single year until 2050 in order to meet the BC climate targets. And bearing in mind, those aren't the IPCC targets, um, so they aren't what's going to get us there. And these figures are old, and um, we haven't, <laughs> since they were put out a few years ago, we obviously haven't retrofitted that amount of buildings, so they're probably even higher by now. So just quickly a review of, we're still in the advocacy phase for PACE, we don't have legislation or program up and running. There were, prior to our involvement, a few resolutions calling for PACE at the Union of BC Municipalities Conference, which is the conference of all the mayors and councils across BC. We had a small program in Vancouver called the HELP Program, which I believe only resulted in 12 projects. We also have a, a city currently, a, a Spanish, who's trying to create their own LIC program because there are a number of oil, uh, homes in Saanich that run on the old oil heaters. Um, and they're also really encumbered in doing that. And they believe they're gonna have to pass, if they wanna do their own in-house program, have to pass a separate bylaw for every single property that they enable for PACE. Um, and so um, myself, I was working for Force of Nature that had done some community organizing. We'd done a lot of work door to door talking to people about climate solutions and clean energy improvements and really had a felt sense of what the barriers were on the ground for people um, uptaking these kind of retrofits. And one of my, our volunteers, Sandra, put me in touch with Brian from Pace Alberta, who shared his, uh, the Pace Alberta and the US model vision for Pace. And that really landed with us because it, it really seemed to address all the barriers that we were really familiar with hearing about on the ground. And so myself and Sandra and a local counselor, Amy Lubick, formed Pace BC. Um, and with the mandate that we wanted to create a PACE program in BC that's voluntary and opt-in for all parties as private sector investment, third party, organi uh, third party administration, and it's available for residential PACE and commercial PACE, retrofits and new construction, and um, has transferability so ensures those lines are tied to the property and not the individual borrower, as well as protects consumers from predatory practices. So after, over the last year and a half, two years, we've drawn many, many organizations um, to support PACE BC and endorse our work. We've had an incredible interest in this uh, from the Building Owners and Managers Association of BC that, that um, represents all the commercial building owners and managers um, to a number of nonprofits, um, to small service providers, as well as uh, we're starting to see some interest from finance as well. And so some of the advocacy we've done is we went back to the Union of BC Municipalities and my colleague Amy Lubick um, presented a resolution on behalf of the city of Port Moody that got almost unanimous support calling for PACE. Um, we have done a lot of government relations. Uh, Pembina Institute, who I think talked to most of the other presenters here and put together a really comprehensive briefing on best practices and design principles for PACE. And that was really, really helpful in our advocacy. Um, really getting those, being able to really hammer those points about private capital and third party administration and transferability home, um, using the context from all, like everything we've heard before and the stories from across Canada um, and really putting it succinctly into one document that we could use to share with policymakers and that really helped it land with them from a, a credible source. We worked with a lawyer to create some draft legislation, enabling legislation, um, some of our members of uh, PACBC published an op-ed and we did a letter to the ministers with all of these signatories that we've shown you here before. Uh, we've done a few webinars with municipal leaders as well locally. And we teamed up with Help Cities Lead, which is a local campaign um, calling for five different municipalities to ask the provincial government to enable five different initiatives regarding um, 
allowing energy efficiency in buildings. And they've helped us get a bunch of municipalities on board um, supporting PACE at the municipal level. So those municipalities are going to be advocating for PACE for the province. Um, so successes so far, uh, like I mentioned, the UBCM resolution passed. We had uh, two parties commit to PACE in their election platforms, and then we had the NDP party get elected to government last year, and they mentioned a commitment to PACE in three of their ministerial mandate letters, and shortly thereafter, they put out a RFP for a PACE roadmap proposal, um, and that was answered by a company, Dunsky Consulting Court Firm, that sent some of the other PACE work across Canada, and they're now working on a proposal to the provincial government for implementing PACE. Some of the challenges we are facing are, um, you know, getting that vision to land, I think, again, um, trying to make sure that we start out learning from the lessons across Canada and in the U.S. and, and making sure we get really strong enabling legislation out the gate that enables the private uh, capital. Um, we want to make sure that we get CPACE up and running. And I think the idea is that we we're hoping to get CPACE up and running first. Um, the, Another one of the challenges is that it, the process, while the government is committed to it, it has been really rushed. The RFP that put out had a huge number of deliverables and a really compressed timeline. And what that means is, I think Gumski is on board with some of the, the design principles, the uh, enabling uh, private sector capital and third party administration. And so they're kind of in the mind of a similar vision, but they've been really um, constrained in terms of how much time they have to deliver the proposal and that means they haven't been able to do a lot of advanced stakeholder consultation and that process is being rushed so as Brian mentioned you know this program needs to be uh, in order to be robust needs to be done with consultation of all the program participants in the ecosystem and if that process is rushed we could get legislation that's sort of subpar and isn't going to work and then people can point to point to the programs and say peace doesn't work so we're really pushing for um, you know, as a robust program design and legislation as we can in the parameters given to us. And um, so I will, uh, we're running out of time for questions, so I'll just hand it back to Dean um, and thanks again to the Real Estate Foundation for support for this webinar. Amazing. Thank you so, so much, Katie. So yeah, that was an extremely lively discussion. I want to big, give a huge, huge thank you to all of our panelists. I think we, we learned a lot across the board. Um, like I mentioned, I think the Q&A box has been bumping and we've had lots of answers there, which is super, super great. On top of that, uh, all of our guests have submitted multiple questions when they registered, so we have a lot to cover. Um, so yeah, we're going to enter a little bit of the Q&A period now. Maybe we'll have a good 10 minutes or so of Q&A. Um, so yeah, this is open to all of our panelists, so unless there's a question specifically that is directed to one of them. But yeah, so if everyone wants to, I guess, could jump in whenever they, they want to, or just give me an indication as to who wants to, to answer first. So first question I have here is from one of our guests who they submitted beforehand, is would any of you be able to share some examples of policies in other countries regarding sustainable buildings that could potentially be replicated or, or, or used in Canada? Gabby? Okay. So I don't quite understand. Uh, I don't know if the, the framer of the question could elaborate on that. I'm not sure what they mean by policies in other countries. I guess if there's any other international examples of programs that maybe are similar to PACE um, oh, across the world. Sure. I think Gabby has her hand yeah. up if you would like to go, or and then maybe Brian, if you want to jump in. Certainly for the new building sector, there's opportunities like the building codes and energy efficiency requirements in building codes is a leading practice. It is very embarrassing in comparison, comparing North American building codes to European building codes. You do hang your head in shame when you look at the energy efficiency requirements in European countries as opposed to North America. In Ontario, there is, you know, generally in you, when you compare yourself when we compare ourselves to North American examples on building code requirements for energy requirements associated with um, new buildings, it's it, it we're good we're good by North American standards, but we also know that's nowhere near where it needs to be. And one of the important things to be considering for new buildings, which are a much 
easier opportunity for getting to zero than existing buildings. That is where we have a huge opportunity for driving the market. So we really do need to accelerate new building um, um, getting to zero in order to accelerate being able to get existing buildings to zero over time. I like to kind of highlight the fact that every single building that we just built to our present building code will have to be retrofitted within 10 to 15 years. And I can assure you, it's gonna cost that property owner a lot more money than if it had been built with net zero emissions in mind right from the get-go. So building codes, green standards help to address new buildings, but retrofits are a very challenging market and PACE is definitely one of the leading areas. It's usually combined in with labeling and um, retrofit, re retrofit code requirements when improvements are made to the building in order to drive the uptake of retrofits for the existing building stock. Thanks. Yeah, that, I'll, uh, Gabby, those are good points. And I'll just jump in. So in Europe, one of the um, uh, there was an initiative in Europe that was started by actually one of the early staff members who started at Pace Nation in the USA, and then she went over to Europe and helped establish Europace. And I put a link to uh, Europace in the chat. So if you uh, I don't know if all the participants can see all the chats, but there's a link in there right now, um, and you can just Google Europace and uh, and find the reference to uh, what they're doing in Europe and. They have a big challenge there because they have so many different countries and so many different jurisdictions and whatnot, uh, but they got funded. They got about a, a few million dollars to set up Europace to begin with. So uh, they got a big uh, sort of kickstart, if you will. Yeah, if I could just, oh, sorry, if I could just add one more thing, because I, I can't believe I forgot to mention this, but there's these, this program called Energy Strong that is really advancing in the Netherlands, in England, in Germany, in North New York State right now. Um, I know Vancouver's working on, or, or BC's working on Energy Sprung to get it to their uh, social housing stock. Social housing stock is an absolute new brain, no brainer for prioritizing for net, get to zero retrofit, retrofits for uh, social housing stock. Often they have the same sort of archetype, so you have a lot less variety in different types of housing. And one of the key things that's really, really interesting about the Energy uh, Sprung model is that instead of actually disrupting the residents inside the buildings they do a lot of their work through exterior cladding so they just kind of go into the neighborhood to get you know move people out for a week get all of the work done and then a week later the the residents come back in to a completely net zero building um, after that time period i cannot Sorry. speak highly enough about energy sprung can't wait till we can make it work here <laughs> I, put a, I put a link in the chat to energy sprung canada as well so you can take a look at that Great, thank you both. Um, I guess we can move on to a different question. So this is live from the audience right now. Um, so first they say, great presentation from an anonymous attendee. Uh, can PACE be a catalyst for inclusive green financing that provides opportunity for equitable, diverse, and an inclusive green transitions to better retain community wealth and reduce energy poverty? Sure. So Who would like to tackle that first? Right. Yeah, um, yeah, sure. So um, Pace Nation, if you go to the Pace Nation website, and I put a link into uh, in the chat for Pace Nation, uh, you'll actually see that they're actually working on very actively working on making uh, retrofits available for uh, lower income communities. So working with not for profits, making sure that the programs are targeted in such a way as to be able to to uh, access those uh, those uh, demographics, if you will. Um, and then the other aspect of it is, is that because the, the programs are uh, capital agnostic, they don't really care where the money comes from. <laughs> community uh, organizations and community banks, if you will, as uh, um, uh, our Energy Guelph is working on this program, where uh, communities can get together, fund the community bank or the community investment pool, and that investment and then in turn is able to then fund PACE projects through that PACE financing channel, which does a number of things. One, it provides access to the community for the financing, but also provides the security on the return without having the administrative burden and overhead that, come, that typically comes with that security. So it's a great win-win scenario when you, when you combine those together. Would anyone else like to jump in on that question or? 
Uh, I, I will actually, I'll just one of the things I, I'm really quite excited, excited about the possibility of like, right now we have a market in terms of green bonds that is really for big investors, like pension funds that they kind of chip into. Like community bonds are not something that we actually have been able to advance because of the administrative costs associated with managing those bonds. I'm quite excited. I would love to be able to invest in, um, you know, uh, an, a bond investment that has a rate of return that is actually geared towards um, uh, achieving GHG reductions and addressing energy poverty and a whole bunch of stuff. And I bet you a lot of other people would look to be interested in that investment too. The one thing that is always the challenge is like, what's the interest rate that the that people are willing to kind of buy into? And how does that relate to the customer in terms of the, 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 the attractiveness of that interest rate? There's the interest rate the investor wants, and then there's the interest rate the borrower wants. Is there a balance between community bonds and the um, the customer interest rate that they're willing to pay? That's something that we have to ask, and and we'll learn more as as we, more programs come into market. Yeah, as time goes on. Hey, uh, Dean, I'm going to jump in and just piggyback on on Gabby's answer, if you don't mind, because what they found in the U.S. for commercial pace for C pace, the interest rate is basically a non consequential. Um, factor for the commercial pace borrowers in the sense that they do an analysis. I mean, they're competitive. The, the rates typically run for commercial pace anywhere around four, five, six percent, sometimes a little bit higher, but it depends on the risk that's involved for the borrower and for the lender, of course. Um, but it's just part of their equation. So when they look at it and they say, well, it pencils out at seven percent, it works. We're still going to be on the positive side of a savings investment ratio makes the business case and away they go. On the residential side, rates are often between three and 5%, sometimes as high as six. But again, for the residential customer, the fact that they can fund 100% of their project upfront with no money down and then pay for it over amortized, like I say, as much as 30 years. Uh, again, the calculation isn't so much the rate as much as how much are they gonna pay every year and can they make that calculus work? Yeah, for sure. I think maybe we'll have one more question, which I think like wraps everything up and I think everyone could sort of jump in on. Um, also, uh, we're going to share the screen with all the resources uh, just to have that all available for everyone, just so everyone could, you know, take a look, take a screenshot if they want to. Again, we'll share all this after, but just to have those there for now, if you wish. So this question is, again, for everyone. So what have you personally found out to be the most effective strategy so far in terms of getting the right messaging across and getting this vision to land with decision makers? What are the most important steps that PACE advocates can take to advance PACE moving forward? Who would like to chime in first? I can I can start with that. I would say the the biggest challenge that we've had is really getting that that vision to land. Um, and I think especially if you're there's sort of a chicken and an egg situation where you need to get a good enabling legislation in order to attract the financers, but um, without the financers on the table lobbying to the government, um, it's it's hard for advocates and nonprofit folks to really have our our message land and to really clearly explain what the finance sector is going to need to do this. Um, so the process is kind of iterative, and um, but I think that really having, uh, getting our messaging together and getting Pemba on the board with that briefing and putting everything together and really building allies slowly on pace that really got the message and then having this bank of sort of credible allies uh, all reinforcing the same message has been really helpful to us. Yeah, Gabby, I think you wanted to chime in. I will admit, and I uh, on this one, when I am actually talking about uh, talking with these about these programs with municipalities, I often um, kind of put the GHGs as uh, uh, the cherry on top. That really one of the key things to keep in mind is that a lot of the money that um, the community uh, residents spend on energy often leaves the community. There, it's a it's a drain for most communities. It doesn't stay local. These energy efficiency retrofits are local jobs, local economic development. It reduces people's vulnerability to energy price increases and carbon price increases over time. So it builds financial resilience on the part of residents. Even more importantly, it also has local job creation opportunities. These are labor intensive 
work that needs to happen. So it does require a large labor force and is a huge job creation opportunity. In addition to that, it's a great transitional kind of area too, because these are these types of jobs, they don't necessarily require years and years and years of training. There's re training requirements. And I, you know, we're going to, we, we have to put that kind of bringing that building science expertise and training into the uh, renovation sector. We definitely have to do that. But um, it, it's a great transition. There's going to be a lot of changes in jobs on our post-COVID uh, post recovery. Energy efficiency is an absolute no-brainer for that job creation opportunity. It covers a whole bunch of different policy goals that we all have. Great. Would uh, Brian or Katie like to jump in or shall we wrap up first? Yeah, go for it. Sure. Um, yeah, just I, I would add to that just when you're talking to the municipalities, um, really emphasizing how low risk having a PACE program in place is. It's an opportunity for them to make a, a return on the investment. You know, they're gonna make a bit of money back in interest. They can put that back into the program. They can put that into other needs within, within the community. Um, and anything that can be done to simplify it for the municipalities, you know, if it is possible to have that third party administrator or, or ways to make the program um, very simple, low administrative burden, very easy for, for the municipality to run. And again, like we're very lucky where we have support of Department of Energy and Mines offer, offering those grants and things. So if there's anything you can encourage um, your provincial or, or local government to do to, to further support PACE, that's great. That'd be kind of my addition. Brian? Sure. Well, this is, might be a bit controversial. So first, it, it is super important to get the base legislation as has been mentioned a number of times here. Um, so politicians have to get it. My experience though, after lobbying politicians in Alberta for a number of years is that they have fairly narrow bandwidth and, and time attention. And so they tend to go, okay, I got the idea. Thank you very much. And then they hand it off to their bureaucrats. And so what we've discovered is, is that, and this has been a message from, from the US as well, you need somebody within the administration or within the, the political machine <clears throat> or who's very close to the top who can be a PACE champion, but who's prepared to take the time to fully understand the whole ecosystem, not just the tool. Because if they understand the ecosystem, then as things are being developed, they'll, they'll be able to spot things and go, okay, no, that's a problem, whatever. Uh, encouraging an inclusive process. And this is interesting. Again, Katie mentioned this sort of... Uh, Dunsky were hired, but then they were given a very short fuse. And that's part of the problem is, is that politicians are often looking at their time horizon. They have a four-year window. They want something to be implemented so that they can go, hey, look, see what we did, elect us again, kind of a thing. The problem with PACE is that it takes, there's some runway involved. And if you want to do it right, it's often going to be a one to two year process. And then it takes a while for it to ramp up. So getting politicians to get over this is not going to be delivered perhaps within my time frame, and still still see the benefit of it. Um, you know, selling the jobs, selling job diversification, the green file, again, it depends on who you're talking to, but I'm going to plant, a, 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 not a seed, but a sort of say of something somewhat controversial here. I think Canadians are our own worst enemy because we were out of the gate on sustainability for years ahead of the US, I would say. And honestly, I've run into a number of people who are, and I'm not going to name names here, but there are some very large sustainability advocates, champions, uh, consultants, et cetera, in Canada who are down on pace. And I'm not sure exactly why. I've never been able to have a really good conversation with them about this, except my understanding is, is that it, in some cases, it cuts into their own business case because a lot of these consultants provide services to municipalities on how to deliver grants and subsidies and programs, which PACE could be a challenge for. And when politicians go, oh, what's this PACE thing? And they turn to their established network of sustainability consultants and say, what do you think of this? And if they listen to the voices of those who go, yeah, it's a complicated program, maybe you shouldn't make it a priority, it gets pushed to the back burner. So I think what one of the biggest challenges I think is to get enough public outcry and demand for robust, healthy, unlimited funding capital and straightforward simplicity, as has been mentioned so many different times for residential pace, especially, um, and getting that message across. And I think if I was to simplify it, really political, getting a political champion and getting a, a bureaucratic champion, you can get those two 
within the government that you're talking to, within the, the, the province if you, or the territory, um, you're probably going to be um, moving ahead a lot more successfully. I, thanks, Brian. I just want to jump in with one more point, Dean, because I know a lot of you guys are advocating at the municipal level and a lot of the hard work we did pre-COVID fighting for a better carbon budgets has been influenced by COVID and a lot of carbon budgets are decimated at the local scale. So if you guys are advocating or um, doing outreach to your local municipalities on this, it's a really good messaging that this is something that you can do on the climate emergency on climate targets without spending mm. any money or taking any risk. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I mean, this was extremely illuminating, extremely engaging. Uh, I think everyone gave a really great presentation. So I want to give a big thank you to all of our panelists and a big thank you to our guests for being so passionate and uh, willing to, to ask some really tough questions, which I think is really, really great uh, to see so many people so involved and, and, and like interested in sustainable buildings across Canada. So Big, big thank you to everyone. Um, so we're gonna wrap up now. Uh, I wish we had time to get to every other little question that we had, uh, but of course, reach out to us if you want a little bit more uh, more detail. We had the list of all the resources there. Um, and yeah, so please be on the lookout for more programming coming from Climate Reality Project Canada and our partners in the very near future. Um, and yeah, so thank you everyone and have a great afternoon. Bye everybody, stay safe. Thanks, thank you. Yeah, stay for safe. organizing this all, Matt and, and Dean.